It can be difficult to figure out what to say for your medical interviews. You might be worried that there's a topic that you haven't prepared for or that you may seem a little too rambling. Hi, my name is Darren. I just completed my second year of medical school at Monash University and I'll be heading into my third year and beginning of my clinical placements next year. If you haven't yet, please check out my last video where I talk about how to ace your medical interviews and I give a really step-by-step -step approach to preparing for the interviews. In today's video, I'll be talking about how to improve your content for your medical interview and particularly your Monash MMI interview. The video will be split into four parts. In the first part, we'll be talking about what are some of the common topics that come up. In the second part, we'll be talking about how to structure your answers. In the third part, we'll be talking about whether you should memorize your answers. And in the fourth part, we'll be talking about how you should respond to a question that you haven't seen or are struggling with. Enjoy. Firstly, what are some of the common topics that come up in medical interviews? You've probably encountered some and gathered some from your friends and other resources. It's really important that you prepare for these topics because they're very likely to come up. And if they do end up coming up and you haven't really prepared, then you sort of want to kick yourself. And it also doesn't take too much effort, but just putting in that little bit of thinking will really boost your answer by a lot. So the types of topics that are common to come up can be split into two groups. One are personal questions. So questions that are asking about you and your motivations for medicine, for example. And the second group are kind of medical questions, which in which you will need to do a little bit of research for. So let's talk about the personal questions first. I'll give you a list of them now. Some of the common questions include your motivations for studying medicine. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Have you ever had to work in a team before? What type of person are you in a team? Have you had to resolve conflict in a team before? And have you had to make a tough decision in the past? What's really important for these is that you reflect on your past life experiences and find one that really reflects these core values. As you notice, these questions are slightly different. Um, for the questions where they ask you what kind of qualities you have, you want to give a specific anecdote for the qualities that you say you have. So if you're passionate, tell me, when did you show you're passionate? Is it in a sport? Is it in a, a music activity? If you say you're organized, how, in, in what sense have you demonstrated that you're organized? Does the school committee look to you to organize and plan events? That would be, be a good example of that. For other ones where it's sort of like you need to illustrate an experience and resolve conflict, or if it's talking about your past weaknesses, what's really important here is that you talk about how you've navigated this situation and learned from it. So your weaknesses, how did you identify them? How did you reflect on them? And what are you doing now to, to combat them? And for your conflict in a team, how did you identify the conf conflict? How did you resolve it? and what you learn from resolving that conflict. So that step through approach is really helpful for answering these questions. Now with topics that you'd like to research, there are three main ones that you'd want to prepare for. One is rural health, two is Aboriginal health, and three is transplants. With rural health, you want to consider why do people move away from rural areas after working there for a short period of time? Also, how can we encourage people to work in these rural areas and have more medical professionals there? With Aboriginal health, you want to consider how can we encourage the cooperation between Western medicine and Aboriginal health? And also, how can we make Aboriginal people feel more welcome in medical communities? Finally, for transplants, you want to consider how can we increase the number of transplants each year? And one possible question that is very common is, is money a good way to increase the number of donors? Now let's talk about how to structure your answer. I really like structuring my answer in blocks, in blocks of big ideas. So for example, if they're asking you, what are you doing in this situation? I will structure my answer by what is the first action I would take, another action, and the final action. If they're asking me, what are the main qualities I have? I would structure that by quality one, quality two, quality three. And the best way to indicate this structure verbally is through signposts. And there are two types of signposts. The first type is slightly less important and you can do it if you'd like to give yourself a bit of a buffer to think. And that is at the start of your answer saying things like, there are a lot of issues to consider in this scenario. Or the three main qualities that I think I have are being passionate, being diligent and being organized. Now the second type of signpost is much more important and I'd really encourage you to have this in all your answers. And that is the signpost that indicates you're shifting from one block to another block. So once you've finished talking about how passionate you are, you could say, now, my second quality I think that I have is being diligent. Because when you're talking and it's not written, it's really easy for words to flow into one another and for the examiner to find it hard to follow your structure. By clearly saying, you know, secondly, next, furthermore, now I'll be talking about, it's really clear that you're shifting to another idea and sort of adds a break in a long 
in a long period of talking, which is really useful for the examiner. If you structure it well, it makes it easier for you to think as well, and also easier for the examiner to follow what you're saying. Let's talk about a very common question, which is whether you should memorize your answers. Now, my short answer here is no, for a couple reasons. Firstly, if you memorize your answers word for word, you get really stuck in that rigid template. If you go into the actual station and you have a question that may be slightly different, you might find it hard to adjust. And even if it's the exact same question, in the pressure, if you miss a word or you, you just mispronounce a word, you'll become a lot more stressed because the way you've memorized it is word by word. What I do advise you to do though, is like I said in part one, to really research answers, think about answers and to just practice them a lot. And also related to part two with structure, if you have that structure in your head, you'll know what to say regardless and inside within the blocks, it can be a lot more fluid. So for example, for my qualities, if you just remember that your qualities, the main ones you wanna talk about are being passionate, being diligent and being organized, and you remember some of the examples you have for each one, I think that's great and you practice it a couple of times and you find it's fluid and it fits the time well, then I think you'll be well prepared for the MMI. And I think there's no need to memorize it word for word because it can come off as really mechanical and is a big stressor for you as well. In the fourth part, we'll be talking about how to respond to a question that you're not too sure about and you haven't really prepared for. I do have a bonus tip at the end, so please stay tuned for that. So how do you respond to a question that you don't really know? So if this is a question maybe related to a topic that you haven't done much research in, so you don't know, for example, transplants, and the main thing, the main takeaway for all these questions is to acknowledge your uncertainty and go through some hypotheticals. Don't just go with one idea with what you think is right and stick with that because you may have missed the actual correct answer because you just didn't know. So for example, the question may be about transplants and who you should give this transplant to. If you don't know the correct procedure and how in hospitals they organize transplants, then don't just go with, oh, I'll give it to the person who most urgently needs it. Because that may be your gut instinct, but you don't know it's, it's true for sure. And it also ends up not being true because you should usually give it to the person who can use it for the longest. So in that case, I would really advise you to acknowledge that you don't know and then go through some hypotheticals. So say, I'm not too sure what the correct procedure is in hospitals for transplants. I'm sure there is a guideline and I would follow that guideline strictly to decide who I give the transplant to. This guideline may be giving it to the person who is more urgent. And in this case, I would give it to you know, whoever's in the scenario. However, it may also be given to the person who can use it for the longest. I'm not too sure which one is correct, but if it's given to the person who is longest, who can use it for the longest, then I would give it to this person. So surely one of these scenarios will be right. And I think just the thinking you show, even in the face of a question that you are uncertain about, will really impress the examiners. Let's talk about the bonus tip. Congratulations if you've watched up to this part of the video. A really common mistake that I've observed in my students, and also from what I've seen from others, is that the endings of students' answers are often quite weak. It's pretty obvious that this would be the case because when you plan out your answer in your head, you don't really think about how you'll end it. But it's really, it's really lackluster if your whole answer was really good and then you sort of end with, um, yeah, uh, yeah, so I think that's it. That's kind of a weak ending. There are two main ways of navigating this. One, don't start a sentence that you can't end. If you finish on a pretty solid sentence already, don't just start another one because you kind of want something more to say, but you're not really sure what else to say. If you finish on a solid sentence, end it there, finish it. The second advice is that if you uh, still want to sort of cap off your answer, then consider summarizing the answer. So saying things like, you know, ultimately, those three are my main qualities, being passionate, being diligent, being organized. Or ultimately, to summarize my my response in this situation would be to urge her to speak to this person so that they come to this kind of conclusion. So having a summary can be a decent ending as well. It just adds a bit of time, but if you want sort of a reliable ending, then that summary can work. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's video. I've thoroughly enjoyed tutoring MMI and just working through this period. It's a lot different to the year long subjects that I also tutor. I think it has a bit of a unique flavor and it combines my love of public speaking and also analytical thinking as well. Good luck for your interviews. Please let me know how they go if you would like. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below and I look forward to seeing you all next time.